I, I can see uh, the faces of my students and faculty. And hopefully everyone can hear me. And for those who don't know me, uh, I'm Evan Douglas. I'm the Dean of the School of Architecture at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute in Troy, New York. Uh, and I'd like to say a few words about our guest speaker this evening. It's a great pleasure and honor to introduce tonight's speaker, the internationally renowned artist, climate activist, and landscape architect, Martha Schwartz. Recognized for her compelling vision of a more sustainable planet, comprised of the integration of landscape, art, and urbanism as a dynamic, ever-evolving matrix of social, economic, and environmental concerns, Schwartz is in the forefront of the design profession today regarding a new era of ecological urbanism. The antiquated model of our cities as an assemblage of discrete and conceptually obsolescent systems unable to effectively respond to the pressing existential challenges of our time, call attention to the urgency as proposed by Schwartz for the built environment of the future to establish a more productive, harmonious and synergistic relationship with the natural world. Drawing inspiration from an illustrious history of conceptual and visual artists land art as a, on a monumental scale, and more recently, climate science, geoengineering, and actionable social networks as a form of combined intelligence in favor of transforming public landscapes around the world into magical, sustainable environments, Schwartz exemplifies a new generation of visionaries. Some career highlights. She's a founding member of the Working Group of Sustainable Cities at Harvard University's Center for the Environment, a founding member of the Landscape Architecture Foundation's Working Group on Climate Change. More, recent, more recently, she founded Mayday.Earth, a nonprofit organization focused on educating non-scientists and generalists about the value of integrating geoengineering and global scale solutions into practice, thus expanding the role of landscape architecture. In recognition of her design excellence, Schwartz has received numerous international awards, such as the Honorary Royal Designer for Industry Award from the Royal Society for the Encouragement of the Arts, Manufacturers and Commerce for her outstanding contribution to UK design, the Cooper Hewitt National Design Award, the Women in Design Award for Excellence from the Boston Society of Architects, an honorary doctorate of science from the University of Ulster in Belfast, Ireland, a fellowship from the Urban Design Institute, visiting residencies at Radcliffe College and the American Academy in Rome, an honorary fellowship from the Royal Institute of British Architects, the Council a Fellows Award by the American Society of Landscape Architects. And most recently, the prestigious 2020 ASLA Design Medal, recognizing her exceptional design as a leading landscape architect over the last decade. Ms. Schwartz is also a tenured professor in practice at Harvard University's Graduate School of Design. Reminding us all of the importance of environmental stewardship as an essential core belief for the design community today, Schwartz comes to Rensselaer this evening with an important and critical message for the next generation of architects. We're honored to have her with us tonight. Please welcome Martha Schwartz. Evan, thank you, thank you all. Thank you so much. Um, I don't know. I mean, it just sounds like I've just been around a long time <laughs> with all that stuff, but um, none of it was intentional. So um, first of all, I just want to let you guys know, you're not going to see any work tonight because I was so excited about 
speaking tonight because it's a polytechnic university. I, it was like, yeah, these people uh, know about science and technology and I can really not even talk about the landscape, the stupid landscape. I just wanna talk about geoengineering and I don't mean stupid landscape, I don't at all because um, I actually, over the last four years and that's, I've been studying uh, climate change by myself um, just reading books and have learned so much that it has greatly affected my own out view of what the landscape actually is. I'm one of those stupid people who kind of didn't realize that we kind of need it like to live. But it's been a, a, a very interesting journey. And um, what I'd say is that after having um, dropped my profession about four years ago, because I really thought I was completely irrelevant in the face of climate change. I've kind of uh, gone a full circle. It's a very strange thing. But um, what I would like, what I hope is that uh, with this lecture tonight, I know for myself, just by learning so much about what the dynamics are of climate change and what the real issues are, and then solutions that are just pouring out of science now because we have this worldwide brain and all this stuff is, I mean, it's absolutely the most alive time in terms of ideas and inventions. So um, it's really inspired me to actually incorporate these ideas, starting to do that in my own work. So even though this might sound really, really boring, uh, which it probably will be, um, I'm going to go ahead and, and um, kind of give you a little a ride through my own kind of um, process of, of actually learning about climate change, what it is, um, understanding why the effects are happening, understanding how people are responding, especially outside of the United States, which I believe we all are, we all need to acknowledge. And then these wacky, crazy space age ideas that are coming out of science. And some of them will be something that uh, you will be hearing about like very soon. But four years ago, it was like everybody thought I had lost my mind, but yeah, I, I probably have. Anyway, so thank you for inviting me so much. Um, I'm going to start off by um, giving a short course, uh, a short science course. So let me get my, my uh, presentation up. What did I do with it? Oh, yeah, let's go to this one. So, yeah, let's go to the beginning. I don't know. Okay. Oh, right. no. I don't want to go all the way back. Uh, I'd have to roll. Why, why is it that everything is so difficult for me? I actually live in a miasma where everything around that is technical um, just goes haywire and nobody knows why. So we're going backwards. Well, you can go to the top, Martha, and I think you can start. It, it may say from, uh, in terms of slideshow, start from the first slide, the beginning. Where? You, you can pull down. Uh, pull down where? At the top of your your screen. Oh, here we go. Here we go. Here you see. All right, uh, I have that, and now let me try it. Let me try it. And by the way, everyone, um, I'm so happy uh, to be talking to you guys. Um, whenever this ends, I am happy to stay around until you're sick and tired of asking questions. So I'm really happy to really take that on. So. Um, I just started off with this, you know, why we may need geoengineering. And it, it used to be May, but now um, it's will because we are, there's no like if, ands, or buts, at least certainly in my assessment of where we are. So here's our very first uh, course. And the reason I'm doing this is that there are some fundamentals that everybody kind of needs to, to learn about in order to grasp the ideas behind what climate change really is. Everybody knows that it's happening, but to really know 
about it, I think is a little bit different. And for landscape architects, we're kind of used to this because we have to learn about ecology and that really is about natural systems. So we get some background and we actually are exposed to having to deal with science or organic science um, before we go into a lot of other stuff. But here we need to be learning about um, the earth system at a bigger scale. So the carbon cycle um, is very, very important because we're all made out of carbon and it's an essential element for all life forms on earth. And whether these life forms take in carbon to help manufacture food or release carbon as part of respiration, the intake and output of carbon is a component of all plant and animal life and you guys too, and me too. So um, carbon is in a constant state of movement from place to place, and it's stored in what are known as reservoirs. And it moves between these reservoirs through a variety of processes, including photosynthesis, burning fossil fuels, and simply releasing breath from our lungs. And the movement of carbon from uh, reservoirs to reservoirs is known as the carbon cycle. And because the Earth is a closed system, the amount of carbon on the planet never changes. And however, the amount of carbon in a specific reservoir can change over time as carbon moves from one reservoir to another. So um, carbon is present in all life and all living things contain carbon in some form. And carbon is a primary component of macromolecules that include our proteins, our lipids, our nucleic acids and carbohydrates. And carbon is the chemical backbone of all life on earth. So um, as, as I said, that all the carbon that we have on earth, we have had, and we will always have. So all things are actually connected and are part of the carbon cycle and the cycle of life. So what is, the, oh, sorry, I'm going backwards. Is this right? Okay. So again, this, this image shows, um, it's, it's very simple, but it shows that the carbon actually cycles in and cycles out. And it goes up in the air, it goes through the, the uh, water, it, the water takes it down. And these things are always trading carbon. And this is important because one of the main things that we have to do now is we have to take down carbon out of the atmosphere. Um, there's, there's a lot of carbon up there that we've put up there and that um, every living thing, when it actually gets put into the ground or burned up or whatever way we wanna go, we release the carbon back into the atmosphere. So the next thing is uh, about our carbon sinks and these carbon sinks are places or areas that actually take down, <clears throat> sorry, take down carbon. So, um, it, these are all the reservoirs I was talking about, and they accumulate and store carbon containing chemical compounds for an indefinite period. And thereby it lowers the concentration of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. And globally, the two most important carbon sinks are vegetation and the ocean. Roughly the atmosphere and the land absorb each 25% of all carbon dioxide and the ocean absorbs 50%. So here we go. This is a famous trend birth diagram. It's the energy budget. And this has everything to do with what's happening in climate change. And this measurement shows that um, at this point in this diagram, it showed how the sun's radiation, which comes in as uh, radiation and then, then uh, it actually goes back as heat actually is instability because it, it actually bounces back off the surface of the land, off the surface of clouds, off the surface of water, and, and also take it into the soils and everything concrete and then ra radiates it back out. So this actually shows um, an earth that is in balance. And what we had for the past 10,000 years when we were in the Holocene era was a very regular, um, 
earth. We had regular seasons. We knew when to plant. We knew when it was going to get cold. We knew what winter was. Uh, now, we don't. We're in the Anthropocene. We don't know what the seasons are going to be. We kind of have an idea that they're kind of wonky now and they, they're cold when it should be hot, it's dry, it's cold. And so that is just gonna to continue to be more and more irregular. We've ab absolutely kind of knocked the irregularity of the Holocene, which allowed us to actually um, uh, create agriculture and we're able to create enough food that people could grow civilization. That's kind of not, not now. <laughs> So this one is a simple one. It shows that it's the same diagram, but it shows that we are out of whack. And um, here you can see it looks like a, a blue rainbow, but that is the greenhouse gas layer. And the greenhouse gases can sufficiently absorb infrared radiation, meaning the heat. And while solar radiation is being reflected out as usual, the red long wave radiation of heat is being deflected back down to earth by the greenhouse gas layer. Uh, therefore, it's warming us up. So it's, you know, we're, we are like, have, we have a great big thick blanket over the earth and the, the uh, heat cannot uh, get, get out of it. And so this graph is quick. It shows the rise of global average temperatures rising decade by decade. And the IPCC report from the UN released in October uh, 2019 warned that if the Earth's temperature rises greater than 1.5 degrees, the effects would be catastrophic. So um, you, you, my guess is you've, you've read about that. The entire ecosystems would be lost, um, sea levels would be higher, and extreme weather events would become a lot more co uh, common. And according to the IPC, avoiding this scenario would require rapid, far-reaching, and unprecedented changes in all aspects of society, including a 45 decrease in carbon dioxide emissions. So while I'm talking about this, I mean, the, the big thing for everyone, because there is no one that you can go to is going to tell you what you're going to think or what you can think. You have to be able to make your own decisions about what's going on. Like, you know, do you think we're going to actually cut our, our emissions? Do you think that the Paris Agreement is going to make a difference? You know, what are your evaluations? Because a lot of what is going to happen depends, unfortunately, on people. So um, the report from the UN, um, as I said, is uh, something that really is uh, uh, really telling us that we really need to move quickly. So uh, the global energy budget is also uh, because we have put trillions of tons of carbon into the atmosphere, causing global surface air temperatures to warm. And scientists have also kind of estimated that a two degree warming would trigger a host of even more drastic changes in the climate including effects that would be irreversible. So that's what the tipping point is. Everybody's saying, don't, don't go past the tipping point because we don't think that humanity can actually do anything about it. So within the four years I've been following climate change, the metrics of climate change set by the IPCC, from my point of view, has been way overly optimistic as drastic changes have already begun, such as the melting of the Arctic, Antarctic, the Himalayas, and while this is happening, we are putting more and more carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. We are also at the point of feedbacks that we may not be able to harness, uh, such as the, the release of methane. So the carbon budget is another way to calculate the amount of carbon dioxide that we can spend before we hit those tipping points. That was the idea of a tipping point. And um, if you take a look, I'm not going to go through here, but what you can see is that there's carbon dioxide coming up. It's going up into that bar, which is the atmosphere, and then it's coming back down. But at the same time, we're putting up a lot more than we're taking down. So the metrics that are being used here um, uh, are all in gigatons. So I'm wondering whether you guys know what a gigaton was when I started reading about gigatons. I had no idea what a gigaton is. So I'm gonna just show you what a gigaton looks like. Um, there are some fantastic data visualizations that are really starting to come up. Here's what 
um, three gigatons looks like because each block that is hovering over, I guess, New York City is one gigaton. And um, that we have already uh, put up something like 1500 gigatons, meaning 1.5 trillion gigatons up in the atmosphere. And Richard Weller from the University of Pennsylvania, he did this great vis visualization of Mount Carbon. So if you take a look at the little thing at the bottom of Mount Carbon, you see Mount Everest, that's Mount Everest. And that's 8.8, .8, no, 5.5 miles high. And um, the amount of carbon, if you were to put it into the shape of a mountain, is Mount Carbon, which is 32 miles high. That's how much of that stuff is floating around the atmosphere. So, and then the global carb carbon budget, this is a graph. I did my own math, I'm not great at math, never was. And this graph shows that we've already to the left, the light green, that we've uh, released 110 gigatons into the atmosphere from 1850 to uh, 1999. And then that next one, the dark green is 500 gigatons we added from 2000 to 215. Now our budget um, in 215 was 335 gigatons that we can release without blowing past the two degree tipping point threshold. So that's kind of our safety release there, um, except that we have added on, on average around 35 gigatons gigatons each year from 2016 to 2020, which adds up to around 170. So you take it the, the top of my really kind of complex arithmetic, um, we have to take out that gigatons that we've already spent and it comes down, we have 165 um, uh, gigatons uh, that we have for uh, our budget. That's what we have before we go over the tipping point. And if we're now putting up 40 gigatons every year, that gives us four years. So uh, yeah, uh, right. So yeah, so I'm, I'm a little wary that that probably isn't gonna work out for us. So let's go to emissions. And this projection of emissions shows three different scenarios. And these graphs always have scenarios and why? Because what, happens, at least even in terms, in terms of making these scientific projections, always deals with what are people going to do? Are we going to get on it? Are we going to really turn the page? Are we really going to take this seriously and dig in? Or are we just going to say, well, screw it. That's not my problem. And just go on our business as usual. Now, unfortunately, the red is our business as usual. And the, you know, the, the green one is yeah, yeah, maybe we can actually do some things about it. And, and um, uh, the blue is, yeah, we're really going to do what we need to do about it and it's gonna be fine, but we're just business as usual. And all the graphs show that we are not really making any steps globally to actually um, deal with climate change, which is really pretty bad. So um, what, what this is saying, what I'm saying here is that 2021, because this is my little red dot and my little line, is at 2021, we are already at 40 um, gigatons per year. So we're even above the business as usual. So that sucks big time. And if you really take a look, let's see what's behind my face here. Okay, right, so if you really, take that trajectory going forward, um, that also is a major suck because at, two, at 20, uh, 2100, sorry, that's wrong, 2100, we are all the way up to, you know, 6,300 gigatons, 6,300 6, gigatons. So um, our emissions are just going up. And then uh, global temperature, in terms of temperature, the, the news is also not very good as emissions are directly connected to global, uh, uh, sorry, to the uh, parts per million of carbon dioxide. And again, my straight line takes into consideration that we are already at 1.1 degrees. We're not below one degrees, we're actually the temperature is rising. So we're, we're now at 1.1 degrees 
above the average global temperature. So um, the next thing is um, about, I think I'm gonna show this, let's see, is that right? Yeah. So the next thing is let's take a, a look at the basic concept of sequestration. So, um, and I, you know, I was surprised that I really didn't have any real understanding of sequestration, especially in related to climate change, because sequestration kind of means different things, like if you're sequestered in jail, but in terms of climate change, it means something very different. So sequestration of CO2 means that that captured carbon dioxide is put into the ground where it will mineralize and be there forever. It is not part of a carbon flux where it goes up and goes down because it's always fluxing. To sequester something means it's put into the ground forever and taken out of the carbon cycle. So what is sequestration reali uh, realistically? And um, let's see. Yeah, I just wanted to say, go back here. And, and this, uh, this is a really kind of funky little diagram, but this really tells it all that the we took the, the uh, hydrocarbons out of the earth that were made from organic material, right? All that oil is made out of plants and dead animals that got squished and heated. And this is what we're all made of. We pumped all this uh, you know, detritus, this organic liquid out of the ground, burned it, put it up in the atmosphere. Now we're going to talk about carbon dioxide capture, which is a technology that's just been developed. And that can actually take carbon dioxide directly out of the air, uh, pressurize it, and put it back down into the ground. So that's the idea of sequestration. So what's the difference between biological and um, uh, uh, geological biological sequestration? Um, geological carbon sequestration is a process, as I said, of storing it into the ground. Um, and uh, it's very interesting because uh, there are certain rocks that actually can absolutely bond with this pressurized um, liquid carbon dioxide. But um, the interesting thing is that let's go to, to plants that are really a hero in all this in terms of taking down a lot of carbon dioxide. But this is a very interesting issue because we've been hearing a lot about the idea of planting lots and lots of trees and how effective trees are in taking down carbon dioxide and they totally are however we have to understand that the trees that we'll be planting today will take a hundred years to really get up to the point where they're really you know taking down a lot it can take a long time and then we also have to understand that in terms of carbon, uh, uh, carbon dioxide removal, at some point when they die, they re-release their carbon dioxide. So it's always in flux. It isn't really the same as taking carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and having it you know, put down, taken out of the, the, um, the cycle. So uh, most people don't really get that, but um, yeah, it's something to, to know. So, the Earth system is kind of like the, the um, this is a very important concept. And it's how the, the people in Earth, Earth science describes the Earth's interacting physical, chemical, and biological processes. And the system consists of many of these spheres, such as the lith 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 lithosphere, God damn it, sorry, the biosphere, atmosphere, hydrosphere, and the cryosphere. There are a lot of other spheres. And it includes the plant's natural cycles, the carbon, water, nitrogen, phosphorus, sulfur, and other cycles. And also the deep earth processes and, and also life, the biosphere, us, which include um, uh, us and all the other animals and plants that are living. And it's an integral part of these systems. And life effect, affects the carbon, nitrogen, water, oxygen, and many other cycles and processes. So these fluxes actually, we're part of these fluxes. So it's one thing to, we have to kind of understand that we actually are part of these earth systems to the point we're actually driving them. So 
we are drivers of the Earth system. We have put it off balance. We have put so much carbon dioxide up into the atmosphere that we're changing the total geology the, the, of, of the Earth. Um, and uh, I think we have to stop and step back to reckon what the price will be for our success in our battle to conquer nature, which the price will be extremely high, that somehow we just lost touch with its value. I mean, the sad thing now are that the scientists and the uh, economists are figuring out the, the cost of, let's say, chopping down a tree because a tree provides, it's called environmental benefits. Like if you like to breathe oxygen or, you know, if you want to, um, you know, eat food. I mean, all of these things actually are valuable to us, but we never accrued that value to natural systems. So now that's actually starting to, to, to actually be part of the conversation. So we are now, as I said, currently at 1.1 degree above pre-industrial levels. And March 2020 was the second highest temperature in 141 years. So it will not take a lot to get to our 1.5. So even one degree of warming can cause, and we see has caused wild variability and between, between uh, uh, that and two degrees, we're going to really see risks of uh, abrupt or irreversible changes. Um, however, I wanna fast forward to the near future, 2050, and the reason is, is when you start looking at graphs and trying to assess what's going on, it's usually in like where we are now in 2050 and 2100. So in 2050, I might even be alive, probably not, but you guys will. And my assumption is that you are all well versed in climate change, its causes and effects. But let's go to a little bit larger scale of thinking. And all of us who are lucky enough to live in the global industrialized countries we need to see what's going on now. So as I said, these, these impacts are coming harder, sooner, more. Um, ocean acidification is continuing because as the ocean sucks down carbon dioxide, the carbon dioxide interacts with calcium and it's, it, it's the acid actually breaks down the calcium and all the animals and the plants that have calcium are starting to lose their calcium. Unfortunately, the, the coral is too bad, but our problem is that the phytoplankton in the ocean that creates 50% um, of all our, our oxygen, they are also going to be dying as well. So like if we didn't really care about phytoplankton before, um, I care about phytoplankton now because uh, how we stop ocean acidification, I don't know. Melting Arctic, we've heard of that. That is a cat catastrophe. These are all the melting glaciers. Um, and uh, there are great consequences, especially as far as agriculture, because all the agriculture around the world depended on the glaciers and the, uh, to melt and bring down the meltwaters in the springtime so that they could do their agriculture. So now that is becoming a little bit tough. And as, you know, in the United States, we're going to feel the effects of that because so much of our food comes from the West Coast, which actually depends on the ice melt from the Sierras. Sea level rise. Global deforestation, which is really a sin. Um, this is the Amazon, which has now become a, um, a carbon chimney because it's, it's dying. And the amount of trees and that is, is, are dying or being built uh, actually are putting more carbon dioxide up than now the Amazon has taken down. Uh, be, usually, this, the reason is, is because um, this whole area is being deforested. So other countries who are having a problem with uh, producing food, especially beef, um, they're just cutting it down so that they can raise cows so that we can have Big Macs. Extreme heat, that is a very um, important issue because we have a very small range that human beings can deal with under heat. Wildfires, droughts, uh, yes, my Eastern Siberian Arctic Shelf. Um, this is really a problem because um, the, there is a whole band of permafrost that goes around the top of the world. It goes from Russia all the way down and around to Canada. And all this permafrost are like 
many, many 30 feet, you know, a mile down, this is all organic material that never rotted because it was frozen. Now it's like a, a refrigerator that broke and all the stuff in your freezer is rotting away and releasing a lot more, releasing methane. And methane is 28 times more powerful a greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. And the scientists don't exactly know what to do about that, but it sucks, it's not a good idea. And, and this is a methane, this is actually, this is what I saw four years ago when I thought I can't do my, I, I'm not relevant, this is crazy. I have three kids and I was part of all this and it was like, I gotta do something about it. But methane goes up, the feedback loops go up very, very quickly and, and kind of fuel each other into getting hotter and hotter. Um, here's a little calthrate. Um, these great big giant holes are being blasted up from the bottom of the ocean. This is in, in um, a Siberia, and they don't quite know exactly how it happens, but the great big holes that are blasted by methane. Floods, uh, we're aware of floods. We know we're getting floods in the United States everywhere. And now uh, we're at the two two degree 2050 tipping point. But, you know, um, I'm skeptical as whether at 2050, I, I, I think it's probably going to be higher. So um, here are other really uh, things that are going to be happening. Like this is the news in, you know, that is happening and will have happened by 2050. Of course, the, the, uh, the ice shelves in Antarctica, but they found out that the ocean fluxes and the streams in the ocean is actually, um, there is a warming uh, stream underneath Antarctic. So it's actually melting from the bottom. You, we had, don't have enough problems. Sea level rise, um, I, I believe that there is, uh, that sea level rise is going to be rising much uh, higher, more, more quickly. And, um, it could even go up to uh, you know six to eight feet by perhaps the end of the century, and um, many many people, especially in Southeast Asia, are really going to be uh, in, in massive trouble. We'll talk about that. Water stress around the world um, uh, that is happening now, but this is what is going to be a real problem uh, in the future. The economic impacts. What's interesting here is that you can see the economic impacts for all the other countries outside of Western Europe and North America have are going to have the biggest economic impacts and they have the least money. Now, this is a, a trope that I really wanted to talk to you guys about because very, you know, after having lived over, uh, overseas for so many years, coming back here and understanding that being inside the United States is like being in a box where nothing else ever happens in the world. Oh my gosh, I'm in Harlem right now. So there's something happening in the street. <laughs> so um, these are cities that are going to be threatened by rising sea levels. And you can see the majority of them are in the South in Southeast Asia. Um, okay, now let's talk about the global South and the global North. Uh, I was not aware of this. Um, I just started really digging into this a couple of years ago, but the global South, the people in the global South is in the front line of climate change as these countries are closer to the equator and the climate is heating up there more quickly than the Northern hemisphere. Uh, the global South is the front line. As these countries are closer to the equator, they are also uh, less able to take care of themselves and to protect themselves. So 25%, so yeah, so, so this one here is kind of tells it all. 25% um, of the global population, uh, actually that's the global north. And if you take a good look at that, uh, let's see who constitutes the global north. Hmm, it must be the Canadians who are the problem. And there's a uh, Western Europe and you know, it's based on colonialism. I mean, the, these countries, you know, were all co colonized by you know, the Brits and the Western Europeans. I don't understand how that'll happen. But the idea of categorizing countries by their economic and developmental statuses began during the Cold War. And it is a socioeconomic and political division, not exclusively 
uh, and a geographical term. It is based on colonialism. And the nations in the North tend to be wealthier, less unequal, more technologically advanced and considered more democratic. Um, it's true that as the nations become economically developed, they may become part of the definitions of the North, regardless of geographical location. But similarly, any nations that do not qualify develop for developed status are in effect deemed to be part of the South. And these countries are generally poorer, more poorly developed with younger, more fragile democracies that are heavily dependent on primary sector exports and frequently share a history of past colonialism by guess who? Yep, the Northern states. Nevertheless, the divide between the North and the South is often challenged um, and said to be increasingly incompatible with reality. Well, I, you know, after Trump, I'm not sure what reality actually is anymore. But so climate change presents a real issue for the global South. And um, we're going to be walking into a planetary scale of inequities, because I know that we have been really suffering from our own foibles and, and, and sins as Americans as, uh, and, and well-deserved. But unfortunately, we have others as well. But since we're so... Um, wrapped up in ourselves, we tend not to take a look at the outside world. So that's what we're going to do right now. So let's talk about Africa um, and what is going on with climate change in Africa. So you can see here in this map, desertification is, is particularly severe in the global south and saving tropical forests is essential more than ever. Uh, and given that e ecological benefits they provide and saving forests are more feasible but that's not happening. All these forests have been cut down. And Africa is climactically split in half by global warming. The Northern area and the Southern half, they get progressively drier and the middle is likely to see a recovery in the rainfall. However, people are already suffering the consequences of climate change. The Western Sahel region of Africa lies between the Sahara Desert to the north and the Sudanian Savannah to the south. And by 2050, the region's population is expected to, to be more than doubled to 450 million and temperatures are expected to rise to three degrees centigrade above their 1950 level. Uh, from what I understand now, it's more like four degrees. And the women in Niger and other parts of Sahel are amongst the least empowered globally and already hunger and malnutrition are widespread in the Sahel. And as droughts and other weather extremes make it harder for farmers to produce the crops and livestock needed to sustain the growing population, conflict and terrorism will increase. Um, yeah, I would like to also say that in terms of uh, gender inequality that women statistically do much worse than males in the face of climate change. They're left behind, they're not, you know, they don't, they can't get, get information because they're not allowed to go into, you know, public spaces and all this kind of stuff. And then they have the kids and they're not as strong and blah, blah, blah. So uh, it's kind of uh, inequity is folded on top of inequity. So let's go to China. India is not just facing sea level rise and deadly heat waves, similar to the one in 2015 that killed thousands of people in India and Pakistan. This could soon become their norm with the Eastern city of Kolkata and the Southern Pakistani city of Karachi are likely to be the worst affected. Again, the IPCC report says that if global warming trends are not reversed immediately, this increase in global temperatures will disproportionately affect disadvantaged and vulnerable populations. And actually that kind of looks like everybody <laughs> except for North America and Western Europe. So um, heat will affect food insecurity, higher food prices, income losses, lost livelihood opportunities, adverse health effects and impacts and population displacements. And even now India has the most starvation in the world and it stands to be one of the nations most significantly affected by climate change, given its huge population and levels of its own inequality and poverty. So um, 
floods. Floods have already uh, ravaged the country. Um, and what happens, and I'll explain it a little bit later, they're now in a situation where the glaciers are melting and the meltwaters come down in these floods, and then there's no more water, and then it becomes a drought. So India, what has just five years to solve its water crisis, but it's um, the second most populous country in the world with more than 1 billion citizens, and it's, it's uh, going to need more time. And the scale of need in India is also very immense, making India the concentrated center of global water and sanitation crisis. So the groundwater, which has been steadily depleting for years, makes up 40% of the country's water supply. And there was a prediction that a total of 21 major cities were poised to run out of groundwater by 2018. Uh, I haven't seen mass uh, deaths or anything, but you can see that they are riding on a thread. And I wanted just to put in that many, many countries, including the United States, have drunk down our aquifers and paved up so much surface that we haven't enabled the aquifers to be able to be replenished by uh, rain. So that's pretty stupid. <laughs> so uh, the climate apartheid was very interesting. Um, this is really talking about how the poor, poor people are going to suffer the most. And those people like ourselves who are wealthy and have uh, the ability to actually um, uh, fend for ourselves because of our wealth, the poor people are really going to suffer all over the the world. Again, sea level rise. Let's go on to Bangladesh. Um, the sea level rise, of course, in India and Bangladesh is uh, catastrophic. Um, the uh, research has found that Bangladesh, West Bengal, Kolkata are projected to be particularly vulnerable to floods. This is, by the way, there's a um, a site called Climate Central, which can actually show you every place on the earth and what is going to happen in terms of climate change. I highly recommend it. Um, so within the next uh, three decades, chronic floods can affect 300 million people. China, Bangladesh, India, Vietnam, Indonesia, and Thailand are home to most of the people that dwell on lowlands below the 2050 coastal flood levels. And together, these six nations account for roughly 75% of the 300 million people on land facing the same vulnerability at mid-century. And over the course of the 21st century, global sea levels are projected to rise, as I said, between two and seven feet and possibly more. So let's see, let's go to snowmelt. Uh, I wanted to talk about snowmelt. I think it's very important. The, the, this actually shows that um, the circle around or the oval shows what Bangladesh is looking at because it isn't just sea level rise. It's the fact that all the waters coming down from the Himalayas and going through all these rivers, uh, especially the Ganges, actually come out through Bangladesh. So these people are getting water from the, the, the uh, rivers as well as the, the ocean. So um, in terms of uh, uh, the displacement issue, because all of these people are going to have to go to someplace else, um, that uh, the, the sea level rise and the waters are starting to erode the, uh, the, the, the actual edges of the land and, and communities are just falling into them. And this is actually, uh, it's displaced already millions of people. And with about 200 people are moving to Dhaka, the capital city every day. And the city's population could double to 30 million people in two decades, further increasing the pressure on these informal um, settlements. And the Bangladeshis are forced to move in order to stay above water and coastal erosion associated with ever stronger storms, along with saltwater intrusion, uh, has caused people not just to lose their homes, but to lose their land, their ability to actually have access to food. So let's go about and talk about China. 
uh, and a little bit about social instability. So um, China, this is like the mother of all problems. China is a country of extreme extremes. So the South can expect a lot of flooding. The North is very dry and drought stricken. And monsoons will take a longer time to get into the dry interiors of China because as we know, these big storms are just taking their time. They're not going through very fast anymore. Aquifers are pumped dry and uh, China will struggle with a chronic shortage of water and ability to feed itself. Desertification um, is one of the main environmental problems in China and it's a real issue because of its high advancement speed. The yellow area that you're looking at is the Gobi Desert, which extends up till Mongolia, and it is one of the driest deserts on Earth. Uh, this actually happened because the Chinese cut down their forests so that they could actually create agricultural fields, but instead of agricultural fields, now they're getting an expanded desert. So this is expanding and rapidly going towards the east. Uh, the red dot is Beijing, where my son lives, and he's trained as an architect and a landscape. He's doing very well, but it gets uh, pretty nasty. This is a dust storm that rolled in and it comes in as one giant wall. It's very bad for your health, but these things are monsters and they don't know when it's coming. They don't know how long it's gonna last. And uh, they're, as I said, they're, they're a danger to one's health. So um, let's talk about instability and in climate wars a little bit. Uh, the Tibetan plateau and its, uh, its geography near India, uh, uh, sorry, uh, China, these two countries, and uh, China to the rest of Southeast Asia tends to be a real issue now. Uh, the Tibetan Plateau covers about 25% of China's surface, and it's nicknamed the Third Pole because it's the home to the largest store of fresh water outside of the North and South Pole, giving it the name the Third Pole. And it feeds the water into Asia's major, major rivers, which supplies waters to over a billion people. And the vivid transformations on the Tibetan plateau have important ramifications, not only from, for China, but also the rest of Asia. So the temperatures, as I say, are rising faster. It's an anomaly than anywhere else. And the Tibetan plateau holds the headwaters of the major rivers, such as the Indus, the Ganges, Brahmaputra, the Mekong, Yangtze, and Yellow, and other rivers that supply water to Southeast Asia. So the disappearance of glacial meltwaters from the source of the Indus will also have a very dramatic effect on Pakistan, whose agriculture is mostly dependent on the uh, reliance of water from the Indus. And this is also true from India, that all their agriculture depends on the wa uh, waters coming out from uh, the, the plateau. So where are we with uh, the glacier melts? So at least a third of these huge ice fields that are in the Himalayas um, is, uh, is, is melting and it will be gone. So the whole chain is due to melt to, due to climate change with uh, serious consequences for at least 2 billion people, 2 billion people. And even if carbon emissions are dramatically and rapidly cut and succeed in limiting our, the, to 1.5, which we were not, um, the glaciers along the Hindu Kush and Himalaya range will have gone by 2100. So as glaciers melt, they form these unstable lakes which often break, creating deadly flash floods that are happening like right now. And the flash flood that killed dozens of people, this is just last Sunday from the New York Times, was far from the first uh, disaster like this to occur amongst the, the, these glaciers. And in a world with change of climate, it will not be the last. And many, many people die because of these things, but they don't have any place to go. So shrinking and thinning of glaciers is one of the most documented signs of the effects of global warming. And glacial retreat in the mountains around the world has been measured. So um, the uh, Himalayas was home to about 600 billion tons of ice and the rate of retreat has accelerated over the last four decades. So again, this is the same uh, image I showed you before. So you can see you know, that all of these are going to be melting and all of the uh, areas around them that depend on the waters for agriculture is they're all going to be very challenged. So um, while China has control over the headwaters of the rivers, there is an agreement to the adjacent countries 
that the water that flows over these countries can be used by these countries. However, this will likely be a serious matter as water becomes less available across China as well as Southeast Asia. So um, given that China has, you know, it, it's really going to be somewhat of a, a, a very difficult political situation that is uh, starting to rise up now. There are um, strained relationships between China and India, uh, but eventually with so many people dependent upon these meltwaters and the desperation for um, uh, just clean, fresh water is going to be a real global issue. And that's kind of popping up soon. So um, again, the issue of displacement with people is also going to be critical because most of these people can't get in a car and go someplace else or ask if they could stay with the neighbors or go to their mother-in-laws. They, they don't have the ability to get in a car. They don't have a car. So this is something that I think it's very important for us to understand. Again, could be 2 billion uh, refugees. And um, what we do about it, uh, what we as Americans do about it, um, what is our role in this? What is our obligation in this? Um, my heart really does bleed because uh, I know we didn't know what we were doing. But now that we do know what we're doing, I think it's very important that we take a look over our fences and see what's happening in other countries because we're just, what can I say, fucking lucky to be living in the Northern Hemisphere and where we live. So just when you go to sleep tonight, you can just think how lucky we really are. <laughs> so the 1.1 uh, degree climate crisis is definitely here. Um, this one is also, this one came up a couple of weeks ago and everybody's freaking out about it. All the scientists, we, you know, it was insane. Unfortunately, this comes out of, um, of Harvard. So um, we're talking about this kind of wacky new uh, uh, article that came out talking about committed warming. And um, the question is, you know, what exactly is committed warming? We know this. So um, the committed warming is actually the amount of, of um, carbon dioxide that has actually been taken down by the earth. And that actually ends up being how much more heat is going to be generated. And it turns out that uh, we did not take into consideration that amount of heat that was actually, that is embodied in the earth, in, other words, in the rocks and everything. So um, they, th this, this uh, article, the scientist says that we have actually, um, we have another 1.4 degrees that are in the system that has not been accounted for by the IPCC. So all the IPCC metrics are off by 1.4 degrees. So here's my you know, blazing mathematical mind going at it. So we're at 1.4 degrees centigrade, but whoops, we have to now add in 1.4 degrees. So it turns out that we have a new baseline of 2.5 that we definitely are going to be feeling. There's no way of, of getting around that. If we were to shut down all emissions now, tomorrow, it would still happen. So um, of course, this was a little bit uh, scary. It still is scary. So again, with my flashing brain and clear grasp of mathematics, um, I've actually figured out that the 1.5 degrees centigrade to two degrees centigrade tipping points that we've been reading about, if we add where we are now, which is 1.1 plus 1.4 to 2.5, we're actually starting off like at 2.5 and that the two degree tipping point is at 3.4. Now, I don't know what to say about this other than it doesn't matter if it's going to be that, that hot no matter what we do, but it still means that two, two degrees is a tipping point. So what this says to me is that um, 
there is no way around that we are going to be able to avoid this, the heat. Okay, so let's say it's up to 3.4. What are we going to do? Again, here's another one of my doctored up uh, graphs, you know, where the red is business as usual. That's where we are. This is about global temperature. Um, I play with this every, you know, I, I kind of update it. And this is the updated graph with the, those, uh, those metrics, which show us where we really are now at 2000, 2000, you know, 2021 or something in here. And you keep going up. And if we go at the same trajectory of the business as usual, we're even worse than, we're worse than business as usual. We're like, not business as usual. We're crazy, not business as usual. It's more than business as usual. So that's where we're, that's where we're going. So the next one I wanted to talk about is a degree. And people really don't understand the differences why one degree would make such a big difference. I, I like, what's the difference between one and two? You walk outside, the day changes more than one degrees. But it's a way of thinking about what it would take to warm up all the oceans, the land, the air, just one degree. Like if you had to take out, like go and get some wood and heat up the oceans, how much wood would we need to heat up the ocean and the air and the land? It takes, uh, let's see, trillion, billion, whatever, I mean, that's, I don't even know how to say that, but it has a lot of zeros, but a lot of energy. I have a different way of kind of uh, explaining this is that we all put tea or coffee in the kettle, we turn on the stove and the kettle just kind of gets, it warms up in the meantime, it's still cool until it gets hotter and hotter. And if it takes that much energy to heat up six cups of coffee, how much of those stove range, ranges or gas ranges would it take to heat up a kettle of ocean? A, a lot. So that's why the difference between one and two and three degrees is so much because it's so much energy. This, I really found this is a very good graph that shows that um, the, the um, consequences of going up in temperature are not linear. You know, you know, they're, you know they are more of an algorithm where you can see extreme heat at 1.5 that is really, uh, um, it's about global population that is exposed to severe heat at least one time every five years is 14%. One half a degree goes from 14 degrees to 37 degrees. In other words, it's over, it's like 150% more or you know, 2.6 times worse and so forth and so on. So you can see sea ice free Arctic, um, is 10 times worse going up half a degree. And then if you go up a whole, whole degree, it's even worse. Uh, sea level rise is 0.6, not too much, and so forth and so on. These are really very drastic steps be between each um, temperature rise. So here we go. Um, let's just go to four degrees. Definitely there's a possible extinction for our species because we really are not built for this. And the problem isn't that we could not adapt. It's the, the rate of the adaption, that adaptation. It's the rate of the ad adaptation because over time we could, but not when it's happening so fast. And that's true for most of the animal <coughs> plants in the world. So um, <coughs> it kind of shows what's going to be happening um, at four degrees. I don't want to read through it. Six degrees, forget about it. So the killer question is, what if none of this works? What if what I'm saying is actually kind of gonna happen? What can we do at this point? So the scientific consensus is that no amount of adaptation or resilient planning can lead us to a stable, uh, secure uh, climate future. So the uh, emissions are rising, increase in population to 13 billion, renewables are increasing, but not by percentage. The blanket of gigatons up in the atmosphere of carbon dioxide is huge. Um, it's in there forever because it takes a long time for it to dissipate. The climate goals are out of reach, it takes a long time to transfer from one form of energy to another. 
And it turns out that planting all these trees um, is a great thing. It'll take too long to do it. And then what happens when they all die, then you know, they put it back up. Gosh, trees are terrible like that. So um, we're looking for a miracle to happen. So and we're running out of time. So here are some solutions. Let's get to the solutions because I'm really a solutions person. Um, Geoengineering. Did you, I hope you guys are Ren and Stimpy fans. Our family <laughs> are really big fans of Ren and Stimpy. You know what is it, man? So um, what is that? Uh, and Jerry, hold on just a second. Can I pause for a second? So hold on a second. I lost my place here. Okay. So, uh, Let's see, I'm gonna run out of time. I have to go back. So yeah, let's go on to this one here. Um, geoengineering, sorry, I've lost my, my place here. Oh, because I'm getting up to some stuff that I have to read my notes, but it's defined as a deliberate scale of a large scale manipulation of an environmental process that affects the Earth's climate. Geoengineering is an attempt to counteract the effects of global warming. It aims to tackle climate change by removing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere or limiting the amount of sunlight reaching the planet. And although geoengineering is still not fully tested and its effects are uncertain, most scientists now consider that we will have to employ it if we want to avoid the worst case scenarios. I happen to agree with them. The possibility of using geoengineering, however, is deeply controversial. There are big, big debates about this, but I would sure love it if, if you guys could actually enter this debate. We need more people to debate this. So um, there is a wide range of technologies and practices that are considered under the umbrella of geoengineering. And the one consistency is that all these solutions are at a scale that affects the planet. And if you look carefully, these ideas involve the landscape, geology, the oceans, and the atmosphere, everything. The scientists are sticking their hands into all these different uh, Earth systems. So uh, the taxonomy chart, actually, that I made so I could try to understand it myself, shows that there are two major arms of geoengineering. There's carbon dioxide removal, which is the blue, and there's solar radiation management, which is the purple. From these two sets of technologies and practices come many extremely interesting ideas, and many of them can be integrated into the practice of landscape architecture. And this has really been a lot of fun kind of discovering this and then also teaching it. Both carbon dioxide removal and solar geoengineering methods have the ultimate aim of reducing global temperatures, but there are major differences in their modes of action and the timescales over which they are effective. So they are generally best considered separately and different. So we'll start with carbon dioxide removal. There are many ways of removing carbon dioxide, but we're only gonna look at physical and natural carbon dioxide solutions. And the first thing we're gonna look at is ta-da, direct air capture. So this machine is the, a technology that sucks carbon dioxide directly out of the atmosphere. It's like mega made in space balls. If you guys ever saw that, it is kind of like that. And this has been developed by a scientist named David Keith, who is at Harvard, whose group of scientists have helped me teach my seminar at the GSD, which I start off calling geoengineering for dummies. So please don't take that as a slice or anything, but yeah, it did attract a lot of people, but the air is sucked into the machine and the this carbon dioxide is separated by a filter and condensed and then pumped into the ground for sequestration, as I had described before. Um, it's obvious that we should build them immediately um, and the problem would be solved, right? But like everything else, there are challenges to making this work. And scientists in the United States are working on aspects of this to make it practical as thousands of them would have to be built to draw down the over 1000 gigatons of carbon we have in Mount Carbon. So um, the next one is called natural carbon dioxide. And this is actually, this is what was so interesting for, for me as a landscape architect 
This was also considered under the rubric of geoengineering. But in order to be considered under the umbrella, the plantings have to be of such a scale that would actually modify the Earth's systems. And this is where planners and urban designers and the professions of landscape architecture will be going and can go as we will have to plan our cities, suburbs, and rural lands so to regenerate ecological processes in order to survive the mess that we've made for ourselves. But first we have to learn about it. But this is absolute, we have to kind of resuscitate it and figure out how to live in balance with it. Another example of geoengineering um, that you may have already seen is this idea of a trillion tree campaign and you know, other large scale ideas. Um, this one, was that the, yeah, the trillion tree? This one, if you take a look, Iceland is growing a new forest. It looks like in the greenhouse, it's a beautiful patch of grass. It's not, these are tiny, tiny little baby trees that are growing. So if you grow these trees and grow them over time, they will take out a tremendous amount of carbon dioxide. So um, the, the IPCC has uh, actually said this, that photosynthetic carbon ca capture by trees is likely to be amongst our most effective strategies to limit the rise of carbon dioxide concentrates across the globe. So it turns out that even though you guys, the architects, you don't want to put any trees in front of your building because you can't see your building, if you want to actually um, do your job and understand that the trees uh, people can see through the trunks of trees and you can, you know, you can actually shape them. But for God's sakes, don't not plant trees. They're beautiful and um, they don't, they actually really help the architecture. So uh, believe me, I, I've, I've run up that letter a lot, but plant the goddamn trees, please. So, and then this next one here coming from the IPCC, which is a climate change and land uh, uh, that they put out which is a sum, you know, the summary for policymakers, I thought was very, very important and relevant um, to landscape architects. So it includes desertification, um, land degradation, sustainable land management. These are all the issues that landscape architects can deal with, food security and greenhouse gas fluxes and terrestrial ecosystems. These all are defining our, our future in landscape architecture. The list is all here. So for me, the ability to teach students about this realm and the scale of thinking, I think is very, very important. Although I have to say that GSD didn't know what the hell I was doing, but they let me do it anyway. So, okay, let's go to solar radiation management. We're kind of getting to the, the another very important piece of this. Uh, the goal is to brighten the earth's albedo, which is a measure of reflectivity by inserting aerosols into the stratosphere and reflecting it back into space and in intentionally changing the Earth's albedo or re reflectivity and thereby cooling the Earth. It would take less than a year to have an effect on climate once it had been deployed. And stratospheric aerosol engineering does not treat the root cause of climate change. In other words, the root cause is us burning uh, hydrocarbons and putting up carbon dioxide. Um, but it does cool the Earth and it can act quickly it could be useful in an emergency, which is like, I kind of think we're in an emergency now. Certainly if I were one of those people living in India or Bangladesh, I would be thinking we're in an emergency and we could avoid reaching a climate tipping point. There are six main technologies within this class of solar geoengineering and they're all based on reflecting sunlight back into space and cooling the earth. So, um, I am going to show you a bunch of ideas coming out of, of, of uh, these technologies, of these six different um, types of solar geoengineering. This first one, when I saw this, it was like, I have got to do this. This is so cool, but it's called um, albedo brightening. And what uh, they have done, it's, it's their desert sheeting. And they're adding reflective plastic sheets covering 67,000 square miles of desert every year from now until 2070 to reflect the sun's energy. And it may give us some relief. Um, 
it turns out this isn't going to work because of the biodiversity. It, kill, it would kill everything underneath it. But, you know, it was like, what a great idea. I mean, Krista would have loved this. And yeah, I mean, it's like, okay, didn't work, but people are using their imaginations. I love that. Okay, space sun shields. This is all very um, kind of space agey. Uh, this is a radical idea, but it seems like a logical one to me. And it just might work. And reducing the amount of light reaching our planet could cool the earth very quickly, even with rising carbon dioxide levels. So this would allow us to just, you know, burn more oil. But that's a problem, actually. While the asteroid, which helped to wipe out the dinosaurs, blocked out 90% of the sun's rays, we could divert it just 2.4% and, you know, block out the sunlight just a little bit. So uh, one of the ideas is to put up 116 trillion flying space robots, and each would weigh about a gram, and it would be the size of a large butterfly and deflect sunlight with transparent film pierced with tiny holes. And um, what's really, I mean, all of these are different ideas. The one on the bottom right is actually somebody building one of these things and seeing what would happen put out into outer space, but they have a lot of support. Um, from the IPCC, as well as the Royal Society and NASA. So, hey, they're busy working on this stuff, you know, watch it on TV. So another idea is to emulate a NAS, you know, a natural disaster, actually, just like the Jews are doing in California using their lasers by trying to kind of create a fast train speed, speed train, as we all heard. Um, you read the newspapers? <laughs> another Trumpism. So um, the cooling effect of asteroids uh, and impacts of volcanic um, eruptions uh, ended up cooling down the earth. And this was caused by the emissions of sulfur, which was generated by um, vaporizing sulfur rich rock. Um, it happened in 1991 with the eruption of Mount Pinatubo and that unleashed thousands of tons of sulfur dioxide gas. And in the following years, the earth cooled by a few tenths of a degree. And it's been estimated that just one kilogram of sulfur could offset the warming effect of several hundred thousands kilograms of carbon dioxide. So in a global warming emergency, an artificial supervolcano might be just what the planet needs. Uh, except probably for the people who are underneath it. This one is a very, very cool idea. And it's actually one of the most up and coming ideas, which is called marine cloud brightening. And this goes into clouds. I mean, I never got into clouds before, but clouds are very, very complicated. And even, you know, uh, uh, quantum computing can't figure out the behavior of clouds, but there are good clouds and bad clouds and dense clouds and light clouds. So some of the clouds are bad and they actually trap the heat and some of the clouds are good and they actually reflect the heat. So this idea is to make more uh, types of clouds that will reflect more uh, light. So um, this ship actually sucks up seawater and puts it into like a vapor up into the clouds, into the sky. And because it's seawater, it has salt in it. And how raindrops actually form are around little aerosols and they actually, the, rain, the water forms around it. So it could actually produce a lot more clouds and um, create more reflectivity from the earth. So, oops, sorry, I'm going backwards. Okay, micro bubbles. This is, this is, I mean, I don't think this is going to go very far because it takes too much energy, but people are working on how to create a lot of bubbles in the ocean to actually make the water more reflective because the problem with the Arctic melting is the fact that we're losing our, our shield, our, our, our beautiful white shield, which is reflecting light back out into the outer space and cooling the earth. So now they're trying to figure out how to actually protect the, um, the Arctic, not with bubbles, but with these um, kind of micro pieces of sand. Um, it's a group of people, uh, a nonprofit called Ice 911. And um, it's a form of what they call soft geoengineering. And its approach is to try to restore Ar the uh, Arctic ice uh, by spreading hollow silicon microspheres, which is reflective sand on top of the ice in the Arctic. And these people are actually working on this now because um, 
of the, as I said, uh, very soon there will be no Arctic on the, um, during the summers. And the fact that the oceans are dark and take in heat is going to heat up the earth a lot more quickly. So um, these are, uh, will not damage sea life. Um, and uh, they're planning on putting, uh, putting this uh, on the Arctic to a, uh, an area that is about the size of Belgium to hope that it can kind of keep the Arctic intact without having, you know, without melting it. So let's go on to what is solar radiation management. So SRM, I call it, it's easier, is a theoretical approach to reducing some of the impacts. Again, by reflecting small uh, aerosols into the, uh, from the air and allowing the sunlight to bounce back into outer space. And this technique has received the most sustained attention of all the geoengineering proposals, except for the director capture machine and is highly controversial, as I said. However, it has impressive results sufficiently to entirely offset the warming caused by a doubling of carbon dioxide. So SRM, like most solar geoengineering proposals um, would be uh, able to create uh, in the stratosphere kind of a reflective uh, gauze that would reduce the effects of global warming and reduce its risks. And it could do this very effectively. It could do it globally, rapidly. It's reversible and also inexpensive. And it also seems to be totally feasible. So, um, I would say, let me just go back, I missed this, but at the same time, it could pose uh, multiple serious physical risks and social challenges. And nevertheless, solar geoengineering may be necessary to be a player within internationally agreed upon suite of methods to address global warming. So the idea about using aerosols in the atmosphere, yes, came out of scientific exploration of why volcanoes have cooled the earth. So the cooling wasn't uh, because of the dirt and ash, it was because of the sulfur aerosols that were reflective. So um, my favorite planet now is Venus because the reason that Venus is the brightest body in the night sky, except for the um, moon, is that Venus has a, a sulfuric acid atmosphere. It's not particularly a go-to kind of place but it's, this actually is why Venus is so bright. So, sorry. So I'm just gonna try to go over this napkin diagram. This is, let's say the one that actually is the napkin diagram. It's a very famous diagram. I think that was done um, in 1975 at a geoengineering grouping in Asilomar, California, where one of these geniuses kind of wrote down on the napkin what solar radiation management could do in all of the suites of what we need to do. So, okay, let's just go to our business as usual, high kind of top line. That's, that's our trajectory. I mean, this, you know, again, this is a napkin. This was, this, it's not that, it, it's showing an idea. So we have to mitigate, meaning we have to stop putting carbon dioxide up into the atmosphere. That's the first, that's the biggest thing we have to do. Then the next step is we have to take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere with carbon dioxide removal. That's our geoengineering machine, uh, the mega made machine. Now, in order, if you see the bottom impacts of suffering, that's the bottom line. If you were to use solar radiation management, that would take that line below the two degree tipping point. In other words, and if you take a look to the left-hand one, it's showing that this, the solar geoengineering, as they say, is shaving off the peak of that trajectory so that there would be way less impacts and suffering. So, I um, mean, and it turns out that now that these studies are coming true, that this is true. So, um, let's see, where am I here? The now, yeah, okay. So, um, so then the question is, is how do we get the aerosols up there? 
And what happens is that planes would get up there and spray the aerosols out there, which would combine with the atmospheric um, uh, water. And they would get swift, uh, swept up into the airstreams um, to be distributed throughout the world. And here, actually, this is a bigger one, a better one. What would happen is uh, even these, even the atmosphere is shaped differently as, and it is actually closer to the earth at the equator. So it would be put up into, uh, at the equator and then the air fluxes go up higher and then spreads around the, the earth. So um, once spread around the, the stratosphere, the aerosols will reflect about 1% of the sunlight hitting the earth back into space, partially offsetting the warming effect called by the rise, caused by the rising levels of the greenhouse gases. And a few grams of it in the stratosphere will offset the warming. So, and even the amount that would be needed by 2070 is dwarfed by the roughly 50 million metric tons of sulfur emitting by, emitted by the burning fossil fuel industry every year. So you often hear is that we don't wanna put more um, pollution up, it is pollution. Um, however, um, this is good pollution and would save a lot of people's lives. And in the meantime, we're just putting up more and more and more of the bad pollution but we don't want to put more up. And it's like, well, okay. But maybe if you were one of those people in the global south, you would think that a little bit more good pollution might help. But these are the, these are the actual uh, debates that um, it, are happening, which I think is a very, very good thing. So um, the delivery would be achieved using aircraft used uh, that are actually designed to fly high in the stratosphere. And these planes are in the design process now. Um, the technique, although having major risks and challenges for its implementation is actually one of the most credible. So once underway, the injection of sulfur, uh, sulfuric acid would proceed continuously. And by 2040, 11 or so jets delivering roughly 250,000 metric tons each year at an annual cost of 700 million, which is compared to the price, the, the amount of money you take a look that cities will be spending every year, like billions and billions of dollars every year to repair all the losses that we're going to be sustaining with climate change, that's like nothing. Anyway, this would be required to compensate for the increased warming caused by rising levels of carbon dioxide and sea level rise. So um, that's like not very much money. Sounds like a lot, it's not. So, and by 27, um, the designer of this estimates that the program would need to be injecting a bit more than a million tons per year using a fleet of 100 aircraft. Now, one of the things is that while we're going through this, this has to be kept up into the atmosphere to maintain a level that is consistent. And one of the dangers is that if these planes should stop short, the earth would rebound very quickly back to its old temperature and that could be catastrophic. So there are, there are issues and, and uh, usually caused by human beings. So the guy who's in back of this, his name is David Keith and he's the Gordon McKay Professor of Applied Physics for Harvard University's Paulson School of um, Engineering and Applied Science. And he's a professor of public policy for the Harvard Kennedy School at Harvard also. And he is one, if not the world's most influential, influential voices on solar geoengineering. And um, I know David, I actually, and when I think about these things, I can't quite figure out how life actually works, but I was teaching um, about urban afforestation and I saw that he was over there. I didn't know who he was. I didn't know anything about geoengineering, nothing but I saw that he had a background in forestry and I asked him to come over and speak to the students. Uh, I, yeah, anyway, that's, that's this guy. So he's one of the few who have done detailed engineering studies and logistical calculations on just how SRM might be carried out. Um, he also has started his own um, company called Carbon Engineering because he, invented this direct air capture machine. And that is now 
being tested and is now being um, supported by American Airlines because as a step forward, I mean, this is very interesting, but as a step forward, um, I mean, the best thing is that we use those machines to take down the carbon dioxide right now. The problem is guess with whom? People. Who wants to pay for those machines? It's not going to make a profit. You know, it's not marketable because you can't make money from it. So, so there goes the earth. But what this can do is it can take the carbon dioxide, uh, pressurize it, and make it into a zero carbon fuel. So that um, kind of long distance um, transport, like shipping and airplanes, can use it. So it means that the fuel that the airline industries are going to be using now will, it puts up as much as they take down. So that's a huge step forward. And once that gets going, it will, like other technologies, probably become cheaper and cheaper. And that's when, when we actually have a carbon uh, tax or we start paying for um, putting up uh, carbon, that is going to come into play big time. Anyway, um, there are also, there are ethical issues about this, of course, um, that we need to really uh, deal with that have to do with the disruption of monsoonal rains. Um, also, you know, what kind of uh, lung problem could this possibly have, which it, it can, uh, dealing with the ozone layer. There are a number of issues that really have to be worked on. But whatever one thinks about the potentials of this technology and its application, there is a need for a forum to broaden this discussion about geoengineering uh, so that we get this into the mainstream conversation about climate change responses. And we have to debate the risks and benefits of this because right now it isn't really going anywhere because there's so much push against it. And the push is mostly from the environmental left that I thought I was part of. But given understanding what is happening around the world and who's causing this and what ideas that these wealthier countries that have great technology and great education and great access to everything we want in the world, we're coming up with these ideas and I believe they need to be shared with the world. So I think that bringing you guys into this conversation or knowing about it is so important because you guys, the younger people, you students are gonna be part of this big time. And I'm just kind of hawking the horn saying, look out for this and really read up about it because you can have a lot to say about what is going to happen. So um, the risks and benefits of this, it's a very difficult um, debate to have because we're not in a tiptoe through the tulips kind of space now. We're like, it's, we're damned if we do and damned if we don't. Uh, it's, it's either a bad choice or a wor worse choice. And, and that is really a situation that we're in. Um, the risks are large. Um, there are regional effects like because climate change is different everywhere. Actually, climate change, although it happens all around the world, what happens locally or regionally can be very, very different. Um, so it may affect those. Or hijacking the technology, which is like, yeah, let's do this. And, you know, because the United States is not the only country that can do this. There are about eight different countries around the world who have the ability to research and actually do this. And there are some countries, <laughs> Russia, <coughs> excuse me, that may like to do this so that they can have their shipping routes kind of more easily, um, more easily and make more money in drilling more oil. So there can be dastardly use of this. Um, it could be used by the oil industry and, you know, to kind of, so that they can produce more oil. Um, we could just get lazy and say, hey, let's just kind of keep doing this and we can just keep making money on oil and then all the Republicans can get together, sorry, and uh, kind of make sure that their buddies are all rich. You can tell my um, politics here. So, um, and then uh, the sudden bounce back, which I talked about, and that other countries may benefit unfairly uh, from this. Again, uh, Russia is in one sense uh, lucky doing climate change because it can grow more food. 
And then the other thing is who is going to use it? Who says, you know, who's going to monitor the research and, and the trials? Who's going to make sure it's done equitably? Who's going to run it? Who's responsible for it? We don't know. So these are all things that are problems. Now, the benefits we know would be large. It's not as it might, it might. Um, we know it's a simple technology, it's inexpensive and it's effective. We know that cooling down the earth because it's already be done, been done because of the, uh, the, the effects of the volcanoes that have already been studied. We know that we could stop the polar ice caps and glaciers and snow melt. Uh, we know we could avoid massive agriculture disruption because we'd be able to kind of make, uh, create uh, glaciers again, or you know, make sure that they don't melt. It could halt sea level rise because sea level rise is in large part because it's hot. The air is heating it. And when, when uh, molecules get hotter, they expand and that the expansion of the ocean is majorly why it's happening. But of course, with the melting of the uh, Arctic and Antarctic, that's also a dangerous problem. Um, we're in the sixth great extinction. There have been five great extinct extinctions before us, but we're all traveling along the sixth great extinction. Um, a huge amount of uh, biodiversity is, has already been lost, but you know, major, major um, large mammals, they're gone, except for us, I guess. Provide global social equity, as we talked about the global south, you understand that. The expansion, expansion of vector-borne diseases, like a pandemic that we're actually facing today, which is all part of climate change effects that have been already suggested for the United States. This is just showing where we are going on climate change. And then we could save most coastal cities. So there would be, the events are very, I mean, the effects, positive effects are very large. So. Just to be clear, SRM, it's not a solution. It doesn't go to the root of the problem. All it does is it creates a breathing space and time for us to make the transition that we needed and that we needed to go forward in the 1980s when we could have, and that's a whole other thing. So um, just remember that and that um, the, this, this breathing space could also give us a chance as designers of the built environment to really think about what our future looks like and how we can rebuild it and what we can add to it and how we can uh, critique what we've done because obviously uh, we screwed up and how do we actually um, embrace the land that actually runs under cities and other places because if you really think about it, the land underneath the city is the biggest piece of infrastructure any city has that could be reshaped existing cities. It could be reshaped and re-engineered and redesigned and repurposed. Um, and how we can think of the landscape not as a decoration or as an amenity because we know that the percentage of parks and cities is pretty inconsequential um, how do we actually deal with um, equity, social equity, climate equity, when the poor areas of towns don't have enough trees? We can do that. How do we really start to see that the landscape has a special value of its own if we want to survive? So it's really, you know, like, hey, let's get rid of modernism. This is the death of modernism. We need absolutely a whole new kind of global vision for how we go forward in our, in our um, professions. So I also wanna make the point that there is no one solution here. There are so many solutions and so many solutions at different scales, like learning how we can do better at home how instead of running the tap water forever until it gets hot, collect the water and throw it outside and let it go into the land. That is a lot better than putting it into the sewer. Just stuff like that, we can do that all the way up to imagining a new future for the world. So, I mean, you guys are gonna be part of it. And um, in one sense, once you understand the real issues, 
um, it becomes a glorious world of creativity and hope. And that's what I, I hope for you. So uh, yes, we've started the May Day Earth. This is a nonprofit organization where um, I would say that the vision of this is, a, is climate security for future generations. And this, I, this goes out to my children because that's what I hope for them. And I hope that for, for, for you and all of you and all of your kids, I, this is really a time that we need to be thinking in a very forward way. And that uh, our mission really is to uh, educate people about climate change and to support research on geoengineering solutions. Now, um, I would love to say you can go to our website, which you can, it's just mayday.earth. Um, it's in construction, but you can always contact um, me through that if you like. Um, but uh, during this next half year or so, we're going to be getting it up, up online so that uh, lectures can be seen, our library can be um, given out to anybody um, there are a lot of uh, different things that we'd like to, we want to start kind of populating this with. So um, I think the, the last thing here is that if you like, and Evan, if you like, I can send this. This was my, this is what I did for a good year and a half after I decided that what I was doing was completely irrelevant. And I would say I'm not wrong about that. I, I think that, however, through this whole process, I've made myself relevant again. And that makes me really happy, really happy and really excited about what I'm doing. I know I should retire, but I just don't want to. Uh, it's too much fun. It's too exciting. Anyway, these books are great books. And they're all written by um, wonderful authors who translate science into words and sentences and stories that we can learn by. You don't have to be a scientist to get this information. And they're all fantastic. And I've actually put it in a, a, a trajectory that you know you first kind of learn about the basics and then you get kind of more and more involved in stuff. And um, I'll send you a list, Evan, if uh, sure. people want to read it, okay? So um, that's it. Oh my goodness, Martha, um, wow. Is there anybody left? I probably bored everybody to death. No, no, you still have uh, 325,000. No, yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> That's only still, in China. <laughs> no, we, you, you, you've kept them uh, inspired. Well, listen, I, I have a lot of uh, comments and, and observations mostly, um, and then we'll open it up to the audience and. Hopefully we'll get some provocative questions. Um, first of all, I think it was a it was a master class yeah. in climate change, and uh, I just want to you know I'm sp speaking now for a second to the audience. I wish I had a glass of wine to toast you as well. <clears throat> um, most practitioners uh, with such a, an accomplished career and portfolio uh, would have felt absolutely at ease and, and comfortable in a familiar space presenting your extraordinary work, which on another occasion you 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 promised to do so and and I will take you up on that offer. I okay I'm, I'm pointing out uh, how I mean it's 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 emblematic of a how courageous you are. That is to say that although you spent a lifetime uh, thinking and making and and producing uh, uh, landscape in public spaces that have obviously been recognized around the world, that you chose to to say, okay, time out. Uh, there's something of enormous urgency that all of us uh, as citizens of the world need to address. And, and while it, it, you can see a close affinity to landscape architecture, because there is, um, you, you chose to, to move at a scale of commentary and critique as an educator, which was nothing less than astonishing. Uh, oh, wow. um, and, and kudos to you. 
And thank you. <laughs> and um, you know, I, I don't know if you know this, but uh, Bucky Fuller, a, pr a previous dean, told me this uh, some decades and decades ago. Bucky spoke at Rensselaer, and and he was uh, of a similar ilk, where he was um, a uh, interested in in planetary issues. Yes. And yes. be entirely immersed into the beauty and the power and and the importance of his project <clears throat> as as shared knowledge mm -hmm. to, to a uh, a global community and i uh, although i did i unfortunately i wasn't able to attend that lecture um i re i remember the stories around that and because he spoke for some six hours. Oh. <laughs> and, and, and it was like in a, in a, uh, uh, like a jazz musician uh, with circular breathing. It was just nonstop. Um, it was a beautiful uh, message to our students and faculty and to the, our, our guests around the world, hopefully, alumni. Uh, that had the opportunity to sit in. Um, and, and I just want to kind of maybe revisit the structure of the presentation. If, if I may use uh, this phrase, uh, you outline the problem, which is the death of the planet. <laughs> and uh, then you pivoted uh, two thirds, three quarters into the present. And it was that was, it was a vast amount of information uh, uh, enabling us to understand that it it wasn't just an environmental concern that it it had it, it posed existential uh, threats uh, to massive communities of people around the world and it results in in economic uh, inequality and and death and the demise of the, the living plant life and all this uh, you then pivoted uh, and and highlighted the opportunity afforded with geoengineering. And I won't I won't uh, rephrase that, but I, I I suppose given the uh, monumental scale uh, at which the presentation uh, assumed, I I do want to underscore something which I th I think you got to at the end and maybe in the last two or three slides. Which is, which is that in order to effectively participate uh, in the kinds of, of actions uh, and activities that uh, need to kind of reimagine the planet in the most creative and novel ways, this happens at a variety of scales. And, and some of them can be incremental, as you mentioned. And certainly, and I, I want to, I want to uh, underscore this, it can happen through uh, one's craft and discipline, whether you're a landscape architect or an architect, yes. that you, you've opened up a kind of consciousness and to the extent that now they can, they can take action, there are so many ways in which they can make a difference. Um, so I, I have a, a series, and so you could argue that that's, there's a bottom up and a top down approach and the kinds of policy changes that would need to take place and have to with our administration and the administration of governments around the world in order to really uh, uh, make change and respond in a powerful way given the, the clock, the kind of deadline that you spoke about, the tipping point. Um, it's not to say once again that a single individual, right, who 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 was able to do something in what is seemingly the forest, can't cascade throughout their life and career in profound ways. Um, so um, I suppose uh, one of the the questions I had for you: you're an educator, and and you show that tonight. Uh, my sense is that that higher education on some level is is a little bit antiquated and still 
uh, pursues a kind of siloed model. And, and the, the older I've gotten, <laughs> certainly the longer the, the, the time I've spent as an administrative leader, this division between landscape architecture and architecture, for instance, is artificially constructed. Absolutely. That one would have thought that both of them uh, have so many affinities and inter uh, dependencies on each other that somehow our, our discipline missed the boat. So I, I, as a kind of first question, uh, could you share with us your, your insight about how uh, higher education might change in, in response to some of the things you shared with us? and more specifically how landscape architecture and architecture uh, might undergo changes as well. Well, Evan, I th thank you. I mean, wow. You are really quite a wonderful speaker. Uh, thank you, and thank you for that. I appreciate it. Um, to your, your thoughts about academia, I have to say that I could not agree with you more um, as you know, I've been at Harvard for so long, and I, I, I have been very um, frustrated at how slow it goes, and that actually the private sector <laughs> is going a lot faster. There's a lot more out there that's going right. on. And um, I mean, to the point where, you know, my studios, because you know, I have been, um, Kind of shoebox into design, meaning that we're going to produce designs and they're going to be fabulous, you know, CGI's and great images and design, design, design. And I started going, you know, kind of giving the students like, well, let's just check out and see what's happening in this place and what's it going to look like in 2050 and kind of what are we going to do to actually address that. And I've actually been teaching, you know, studios based on how are we going to make cities climate ready? Right. And that, unfortunately, it entails some research, God forbid. And I was always, I was really given so much shit. I was going over to MIT, like, please take me to MIT. I want to be able to do some research. Come on. Yeah. I mean, you know, what am I, chop liver? And, you know, I mean, there were too many people from Harvard over at, GS, at uh, MIT. I couldn't get in. But, I was like, why can't I integrate my studios with other faculty in other domains in the, in the university? It was like impossible. First of all, what do, what do designers have to do with research? I mean, la la la, we're artists, we love you, blah, blah, blah. But even artists, you know, we, we, even we are interested in science. So with the ability to actually cross over these lines, was impossible. I mean, thankfully, Anita allowed me to teach this geoengineering course, but it was only through her grace because nobody knew what this was. It didn't fit into any place. And, you know, I mean, it's like, yeah, so what? You know, what, wait, wait a minute. You know, why can't we do something that doesn't fit? Because, you know, there are all these lines and it's really frustrating. But what I have found is that, I mean, I have actually, uh, pitched something to the president of, of Harvard about having a coalition of people from around the different colleges because what we're doing involves public health, right? It involves right. policy, it involves law, it involves engineering, it involves science, it involves all these things. We're all touching upon it and could we not actually work together to be able to come up with a very holistic view because we all have our 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 specialties and kind of our, our, our powers, but without having the feedback and having a much more holistic view of what is happening, we're still in these silos, even just landscape architects and architects. I mean, like, forget it. I mean, we really need to expand much more widely and really start to think about programs that would mean that we would have to go to other places within the universities and talk to other people. And, you know, the, I mean, you know, the president was like, fine, you know, you just go find some people in the different schools who want to do it. And, you know, well, unfortunately, I don't have time to run Harvard. I have my own thing. But, um, you know, that needs to happen. And I also, this is the other thing, is that 
there is so much, let's say that the Graduate School of Design could be doing that expands who we are. I mean, why don't we, you know, why does landscape architecture have to do this, this, and this, and this? Right. Why can't we be, why, why can't we be a musician about landscape? Why can we not be communicators about the landscape? Why can we not be, uh, you know, why can we not really think about different ways we can express these ideas uh, and that we know? And, you know, we could become the communicators from for Harvard University because we know how to take very complex issues and still make something. We all do, sitting around here, that's what we do. We really deal with complexity and this could be something that would really be able to be, you know, information that would be able to get out because that's how we're trained. So why don't we use the things that we're good at and take them to different areas? Yeah, you, you know, Martha, um it was interesting in light of what you just said. Um, two things. One was in the presentation you spoke about the difficulty of the human species being able to understand the ramifications of a one degree temperature increase on the planet. Right. The other thing that you highlighted was the the ideological, well, how do you say that? Um, the blind spot that, that uh, uh, North America and Europe reside in, in terms of, and I'm paraphrasing, uh, not either being aware of or certainly taking no responsibility for the consumption of fossil fuels that impact 86% of the planet. And both of these concepts which are factual, are so abstract, it's very difficult for that population or for the, or the world population to kind of understand this information. So I set that in stark contrast to a slide which was incredibly compelling as someone who was also creative or speaking for my creative community. And that was the slide of the Elbedo brightening where you said, imagine what Christo could do with this. And the reason why I bring this up or I, or I posit them in, in contrast with each other is that was, the image was so powerful because it was an index of some natural phenomenon turned into a kind of metallic shroud parachute. And so it, it, it operated simultaneously as, a, as, an, as an indicator of a, a in, in informing us about something in the environment that is undergoing change. It, science, because it's, it, it's a technological device and art, because it stimulates our imagination yeah. to think in profound ways. And, it seems to me that your work and, and, and the work of the next generation of architects is such that they may consider that, they, that there is a, it's a durational proposition that they may not be in a space to change it, but to message the problem out through the discipline that they're working yes. in. Yes, 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 Evan, I, I mean, uh... We are working, we have been working on this uh, number of projects now where um, we've been asked to design the largest airport in the world. And it all kind of uh, generates from the land, but it incorporates a number of these uh, geoengineering ideas, including that it would be a, 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 a negative emissions yes. airport. And that there were, and then also completely self-sufficient. Right. And that meant there would be, you know, many, many, I mean, uh, we work with the best engineers. This is the other thing is that I have, I have such a good friend, an engineer in, from uh, Atelier One in London, who is a rock star. And to be able to work with these creative engineers yes. and say, well, how do we actually, I mean, we have 
how are we going to grow food? Because in this in this area, they won't have food. And how do we actually get the water? And how do we get the energy? And how do we clean everything? And how do we recycle everything? How do we make food for the airport? How do we actually make sure that the air, blah, blah, blah. So we had all these different, we call it virtuous cycles that were codependent. And it's a masterpiece. I mean, it was so much fun, including the direct air capture machines. Wow. It was a blast. And then we used... I mean, uh, uh, one, yeah, I mean, I, it would have been nice to be able to show something like that, but we, we can talk about it, you're dead on, you're dead on, exactly. But, but the role of design in this project is absolutely vital. Yeah. Right? And, and you know, for example, in, in the architecture discipline, uh, it, it's common to have a thesis project and often uh, the thesis project that is similar probably in, in your discipline as well is in, can be incredibly uh, aspirational and maybe even futuristic. In other words, they're not quite sure how to make it, but they can dream it and they certainly know how to represent it. And, and I'm always there to say, but look, what, it's, they're missing people in the room. And if you can't find them during the time you're in college, or university, you find them throughout the rest of your life. Well, I look, if, if you can think it, you can do it. That's what I believe. And of course, we need people who are thinking beyond where we are right now. I mean, those people are so important to us. And of course, you know, this speculation and uh, pushing, you know, maybe it hasn't done, maybe maybe it isn't possible, but maybe parts of it are possible. You know, that's the best you can hope for, you know, for people thinking that way. I mean, only five, 10 years ago, no one would have thought about Tesla or Elon Musk going and creating satellites that are going to other planets. I mean, it is possible. Of course it is. Yeah. And this yeah. generation is going to be around enough time to see things that you and I only dreamt about or read in books. Well, that is why creativity is so important. That hasn't gone away at all. And the ability to take kind of things that don't necessarily fit together or don't necessarily seem like they're connected and making new things out of those things. I mean, that is, that's precious, you know? Right. I mean, that, that is really so valuable to be able to imagine, you know, to try things. I mean, we, you know, trying things, you know, not being so scared of failing, you know, that it's really important to just push ahead. Yeah. And, and it's, it's um, again, the topic is so apropos, given the fact that running concurrent with climate change is systemic racism, oh. is, is a global recession, is a pandemic, is an insurrection in Washington, D.C., and so I can't, you know, you, you've, you've raised the bar. <laughs> In terms of catastrophes, right? <laughs> but, but you know something, um, you know, the, the, the students, it's, they have to reimagine the planet because the adults didn't do their job very well. No. You know, and, uh, and I have all the faith as you do that they'll succeed. And I, that, this yeah. adverse situation and these multiple challenges will uh, enable their creativity to do great work and target really, really imp important projects during their lifetime. I certainly hope so. Well, you know, one of the one of the great things about I mean, when I'm teaching and I have my students, um, it's a very emotional process because everybody comes in and holds it. And who knows about climate change? Everybody raises their hand. Oh, I know about it. Well, people know about it, but that's about it. Right. You know, and, and once you start getting into it and then really start looking at it, it's a very, it's a highly emotional thing. And that, you know, we're like, oh my God, really? I mean, getting doused with all this kind of these, it's sad, it's heartbreaking, it's it's shocking. I mean, to the point where I, I remember my first year, I, I asked them after, towards the end, I thought maybe what I'm doing isn't ethical because it's, it's nerve wracking and it's makes you sad and depressed. 
No, you're you're being you're you're being honest, and um, you're all you're sharing essential information, but but you're also reframing it, which you did at the end. But that's what I mean. What everybody did in the class is they had to come up with a solution that they would do. Right. That could be doable. Right. And and at the end, I mean, it energized people. They no longer felt that they were helpless or they couldn't do something or, you know, it was like, it's very empowering. It was, it is for me feeling like I have some agency. I could make a difference. I could contribute. Right. And, and there's so many ways. I mean, I've gone one route. Everybody has, I mean, there's so much that needs to be done. There's yeah. not a dearth of things to do, but at first there's, you know, there's the education about it. Education, it shows how important education is because that gives you all the tools, the ideas. Um, it broadens everything so that there are possibilities for things that you want to do. I, I'm going to pivot to the audience because they have questions. Um, uh, but bef one last question to you. And how do I, how do I frame this? Um, certainly all the work that I've seen you make uh, lives between art and science, and that the, the best of, of any art project, and I use that in a broad sense, whether we're, we're talking about film or poetry or landscape architecture, is able to kind of uh, one, transport the observer or inhabitant momentarily to a kind of new world. And so you know, within the intelligence of, of the project lives fact and fiction, right? And um, I don't know if you can, if you can speak to those other worlds that, that we, although we haven't seen them tonight in, in actual uh, slides, um, but there certainly have been part of your work throughout your career. Um, and maybe maybe a, a case in point, it, it, it has no direct correspondence, but it's a kind of larger analogy. I'm, I've always, when asked what's the greatest building in New York City, because I spent a good part of my life there, but my immediate response was to say Central Park. <laughs> and it's, it, it's not a building. Um, and in the, in the heart of the metropolis, is a theater made out of natural and artificial entities, but someone scripted that theater and, and it still sustains all this poetic power many, many years later. And I imagine that's something that you aspire to. Well, um, I, in one sense, I, I, I feel pretty lucky. I, I don't have a, a King Tut kind of ambition that something should last forever unless it is uh, valued. And I, I think that uh, it's the people who are using these spaces that will give it value. And then, you know, you have to, I have to, or I feel like, um, uh, I think that there has to be something that people are attracted to and I, I, th I think that, um, you know, we're, we're curious monkeys, like what is this about? I mean, you know, I, I, I think that there are many ways that people can enjoy and be attracted to spaces. But I think that also that as a designer and an artist, there has to be something that is really truly authentic within it. And right. that really has to do with perhaps, you know, our own individual, what can I say, shtick, I don't know, the way we, we see form and we make form or kind of why we, why we do what we do. Sometimes that isn't really accessible to us, we just, yeah. this is how we do things or what, what we enjoy. It's like, it's hard to give a present to somebody if you're not, if you don't enjoy it as well. And then you just hope that what you enjoy is what the other people are gonna to enjoy too, because then you're, you're lost. You're, 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 you're you know, what do, what do you get somebody if you don't, you know, if you think it's ugly and, 
right, right. Because there's no joy to that. So I mean, it's it's really about thinking about people, what they do, you know, how a space is going to be used, all the things that are on the table to solve. But then somehow it's got to be um, there's got to be a beauty to it. Because, yeah. you know, I mean, we, we're all so afraid to talk about beauty. Of course, in the United States, that just means that it's going to cost more money. But um, so nobody ever says that or talks about it. But, right. you know, uh, beauty, I've, I, I, I've done this a couple of times. It's like, why don't we talk about beauty? Um, and I've talked to, you know, classes and I'm like, um, how many people of, you know, um, think that your spouse is uh, beautiful. And of course, everybody raises their hand. Like, it's like, yeah, because that's important to us. <laughs> I mean, it's like, what we see is very important. What we see is very, a very important phenomenon. And it should not be debased or thought as, you know, not important. Right. And it, it really does create so much of, um, of what, our impressions are and what we like and where we like to spend time and what we feel and the sounds and all of these things these you know these are how we absorb our environment and so if you can make the most out of that um yeah it doesn't matter if you're putting chairs that face each other so you can you know have a conversation i mean people like to be left alone or kind of make up their own places and have the freedom so i don't know i don't have any real magical list or anything but i think that uh beauty uh beauty has to be part of it right i agree okay so here's here's the first question of a number of ones yeah. this is from christiana and i'm going to guess it's uh from from one of my faculty members um it's a two-part uh, question here. What kind of role or roles do you see for landscape architects in concert with geo engineers in this uh, urgent future? And also, given the expedited timeline necessary to realize this work, in parentheses, reminds me of the exped uh, expedited work we're in the midst of given the global scientists and the COVID vaccine and that this timeline is crucial. How do we think we will or might know when or if we have done something correctly? In other words, if we go down one path with one or more of these technologies, is it important to have some kind of metric to assess it? How could that happen? And how long would we have to wait until we decide it's not going correctly and we need to reassess or is it going well? Apologies for the length of this question. <laughs> Whoa. Um, well, one, one question is like, what can we as landscape architects do in terms of, um, you know, actually supporting, that's what I'm supporting and getting these things out into the public. Well, um, I'm here tonight. I'm sharing this with people. I spend time and I want to do that. So we can do things that are personal. I'm still a landscape architect. Um, there are things we can do as individuals. Um, there are things that we can do as groups. I think working in groups is extremely important to get things done these days. I mean, I, I think we all have to hold hands. I think finding people who are of like mind is very important. And then you, you friend them. I have a wonderful group of, I call it the girl group. Four of us have been calling each other, you know, you know, every month to find out what we're up to and we give each other support, actually psychological support as well as other things that we can help them with. So, you know, find people who you can work with. You can't do anything alone now. Everything really is about how do you get people together. Um, I'm, <laughs> I don't know, my, my world has so expanded in these past four years, I can't even begin to tell you um, the wonderful people that I've met outside my profession. Right. And I've gone outside my profession. And I think that is an incredible boost to just my whole life and being engaged with other people doing uh, different things. Um, and them getting me involved in incredible 
opportunities to actually make us more visible and more engaged. I mean, to the point where I, I was able to finally get the ASLA to join the International Federation of Landscape Architects, which they hadn't done that for you know 25 years because they didn't like to pay the dues. But in the meantime, the International Federation of Landscape Architects are kind of working with the Committee of Biodiversity in the, the UN. So what the hell are we doing? Right. What are we doing? So you know, we're actually moving along with that. I'm with a group of people now who like our CEO roundtable. We have a group of CEO, CEO roundtables in landscape architecture, the so-called CEOs of the of the leading companies within the United States. And we're gonna actually go and talk to Pete Buttigieg and tell him what he needs to do to actually remake our, our cities. I mean, we can advocate. I'm designing things now at a scale because I've decided I want to work on very big scale issues and landscapes. And I've, I've kind of scrounged around and kind of made pals with some friends in these giant engineering groups. And I'm having a lot of fun with that and uh, really able to actually insert some of these ideas. Like I've inserted enhanced rock weathering. I didn't talk about it. I've inserted direct air capture. I've inserted, you know, all oh. sorts of different geoengineering ideas within these planning ideas and design. So it, it just tends to, to spool out, but, you know, find yourself some friends and really, you know, I, I think it's really, it's, I don't know how it's all started, but it just started from, I don't know, reading those books and then finding, you know, asked, you know, asking to lecture at the ASLA, finding some really great other people who are thinking like I am and are interested and it just moves you along and gets you out into other spheres. And that's what we can do. We can really start to integrate other people doing other things so that we're all moving together. Great answer. Um, this question is from Kedrick Berry. Uh, minority disenfranchised urban communities in America have often been the test population for technology, industrial production, and medicine. On a local scale, is it practical that some of these responsive technologies will be deployed within areas that have been historically deprived and ignored as reparations? How would one go about advocating and officiating where these technologies are deployed? Interesting, hmm. very interesting question. Well, I think that the scale of these geoengineering ideas are not applicable to like neighborhoods or you know specific areas within cities. So I don't know whether I can even answer that. Um, the only answer that pops up in my head is that because these are such uh, big scale ideas that have effects globally, that um, the the fear I have is is that. Perhaps, you know, well, we do know that a lot of these disenfranchised uh, neighborhoods or countries are going to suffer the most because right. we're not going to use it, <laughs> use these things. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, I don't know whether I can really answer that because the scalar, the, the scalar differentiation between the neighborhoods and the geoengineering ideas in terms of testing, uh, you know, the, I can't answer that. However, it's a very, very, very important question. It's like, how, who is going to oversee this? Right. Who's going to determine who deploys it? Who is going to decide how cold the earth is going to be? What is the temperature going to be? I mean, we don't know. And the reason we don't know is that this idea is not being funded. And it needs, it needs to be funded. So I am Martha, working, yeah, sorry, go ahead. No, no, I'm sorry. No, I, I, I just to uh, uh, continue that thought, I think that that's where the provocation is. You, you mentioned that uh, Africa, uh, and that uh, communities around the equator would be the most vulnerable uh, given 
what the evidence is showing. And, and, and so the, if the wealth is away from the equator, under what circumstances would the wealth uh, prov uh, offer, how should I say, carry this technology uh, to that, that line of the equator in recognition that, that the planet is, is, is a continuous atmosphere and surface and that you can't afford to privilege certain territories of space? Well, there are some heroes out there. Uh, Andy Parker has started a nonprofit that is doing very well. It's called Solar Radiation Management Governance Initiative. Not a great name, but there's this guy in, in uh, the UK who has recognized that. And what he does, he raises money and he sends this money. He's working in Africa right now to give money to support research of solar radiation management because those are the people who need it the most. Right. Um, however, the technology and the education is not there. And by empowering the science, the scientists in those areas, those people have the ability to go to and make a difference by going to the leadership and talking about this. And the other interesting thing is that it's very unlikely that the United States is going to do it. And the reason is, is we do not have the moral authority. We have fucked up the world. So, you know, nobody wants Americans coming in and putting stuff up in the air. It turns out that the people who most likely could and could do this because they do have the moral authority would be the island states who are sinking right now. And they need to do this in order to save their population, not because they want to have a shipping route up in the, in the North Pole. Right. So you know, there, there is that, and how do we actually transfer our knowledge and funding to those areas? And this one guy, Andy Parker, is doing that. But again, the group of people who are in support of this is a very small group. It's a you, very Martha. small group. Yeah, thank you, Martha. Here's another question. Uh, I wanna say, this is from uh, Alexa. I wanna say uh, thank you for communicating this knowledge to us in a way that you did. So inspiring for me in particular as an undergraduate student wanting to go into landscape architecture after RPI. All right. uh, this discourse is so incredibly important and the way you talk about integrating it into other disciplines such as music feels so logical and is enlightening when trying to stay optimistic uh, in looking towards the future. Also, thank you for the reading list. I will definitely be looking into those texts for pieces of what I had the pleasure of seeing in your lecture tonight. Aww. So there's not a there's not a question there, but I thought you should you should. That's so that. sweet. I'm getting goosebumps, but thank you very much. And I just want to say that if I can if I can teach myself all about this stuff, you can too. <laughs> it's not magic. So uh, yeah. that is really great. And you know what? I mean, through these readings. And this is really true for everyone. We all have our own way of thinking, of perceiving, of understanding what it is that our gifts are, because we are all very different. And so we all have to kind of find our own path within this. There isn't just one way or one route to go. But you know, it take it took me a while, it took me a couple of years to kind of get in the groove, like what the hell am I gonna do? I, when I first learned about this, um, it was off a, a, a YouTube my sister sent to me about um, a guy named uh, Dr. Peter Wadhams from Cambridge University when I was in London. And it was about the melting of the permafrost and it was disastrous. I showed you some of those images that I saw four years ago. I was like, Jesus Christ, this is not, 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 not good. And I called him up. <laughs> I was like, I really want to help. I want to participate. I'm quitting my job and I could help like uh, kind of, I can type, I could go get lunches for you. I could, you know, I could help you with your, uh, you know, your Arctic uh, emergency group. And uh, he was really lovely. And, uh, you know, we, we still are in touch after all these years, but you know, it was, you have to find your own way. You know, it's, it's interesting that you said that because, um, uh, the cost of higher education, 
uh, the pressure to get a job after graduation, uh, to pay back uh, student loans, uh, to get that license as soon as possible, to uh, somehow satisfy expectations of others, and I'll keep that broad, often uh, get into the way of another interpretation of life, which is that it's an ongoing journey and that you design it. So um, and and I'm, uh, I don't know, I'm provoked by your, the comments you just made that, that the, the internships they get, the mentors they choose, the risks they may, make, they may make earlier in life economically in order to invest in learning more, in being around more brilliant, interesting, inspiring people, so that when they do have the opportunity uh, to uh, work in a partnership or own their own firm, they, have a, they really have a much more expansive vision, is, is just so valuable. So I, I would be uh, curious, any um, recommendations that you would make to our students about that time during school and, and right after school, that, those, that five, six, seven year period, uh, would, I think that would be enormously helpful. Well, I'm definitely on the fringes. I've always been a fringe person. I've never been uh, clearly one thing or the other. I mean, that's just, I guess, my own personality. Um, I, I've never been sure I'm a real landscape architect. I haven't been sure that I'm really, am I an artist? Um, I don't, I actually, almost went, went to medical school because I wanted to go, you know, I, I, I love, I love, I do love biological sciences and I, you know, I just kind of wander around, but I, um, I think exploring the things that you are really interested in and kind of sticking with that. I mean, the things that you really uh, don't, don't, don't get caught by this is the way you have to do things, or this is the way it's done. I actually never went for that because when I went to landscape architecture school, I went because I loved the earthworks artists and right. I could see myself driving tractors and making forms. And, you know, everybody was into ecology and getting up in the morning and taking boats in the river. And I, I wasn't with that stuff. I didn't care about it. I didn't care about it. I really didn't. I mean, I should have, but I didn't. Yes. And I just kind of went along that one track. And if, if I, it, you know, I mean, you should, you should explore, explore things. You don't have to worry, you know, you don't have to worry about pleasing your teachers, you, you know, it's, 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 it's if you can somehow find um, your, uh, your area of gravity, kind of what the thing, thing is that really kind of interests you. I think that's very, very important. Um, I also, um, I, I actually refused to get uh, my, whatever it was, you know, to go take the test and become a real landscape architect. <laughs> Uh, I was like, I'm not going to do that. You know, I mean, it was like the hell with it. I, you know, I don't want to do that. I, except I was after many, many years of practicing, um, I started getting uh, threats from the ASLA. <laughs> and they said, I know, I remember um, I had the, the word landscape architecture on my card, landscape architect. And somebody said, you can't use the word of landscape architect. Wow. on your card because you're not a landscape architect. I said, I don't want to be a landscape architect. So if you ever see our cards, it never says landscape architect. <laughs> like, Fuck you. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> you're, um, you're not a conformist. I don't know. I don't know exactly what I am. But uh, what's really important is really try to see you know, what is of interest or what sparks your imagination or what, you know, what area, you know, that you like about, let's say the topic of landscape architecture. That's why I went into it. It's like, it can be anything. I mean, it could be a bagel garden for God's sake. You know, I mean, like you could just make it up. I mean, the bagel garden was like putting the toilet in the, you know, the Duchamp toilet. That's what that was. Right. And everybody, 
freaked out about it. It's like, okay, that's cool. But, you know, it's really a very broad topic and you can make many things from it and be many things in it. So, you know, just honing kind of finding out the things that you're really enjoying and kind of following that, not worrying so much about getting, you know, your, your going through the whole process. And the last thing is that uh, the most important thing when you're young and just getting out is go and work for a firm that you really like, the stuff that they're doing you really like. And um, spend your time there. Spend and get a tractor. Time. Yeah. You know, just, just like, <laughs> and a tractor, right. Um, that, uh, I have to say, you know, I, I went to a summer school thing at the SWA group when I was, uh, I started um, school or landscape architecture at the University of Michigan, because that was the design school at that time. And I went out there and uh, for the summer school, I knew they would never hire me because I didn't know jack shit about landscape architecture. I probably was never going to. But, you know, what happened there and, and uh, meeting Peter Walker, who somehow was really interested in art. And that's all I could do. I couldn't do anything right because I didn't know anything about landscape architecture. But I kept, whatever problems I had, I would make it into an art project. And, <laughs> You know, I was out there having fun, but it really changed my life. Right. So, um, yeah, go find those places that you think would be interesting because you would learn from it. They'll have you doing shitty things. That doesn't matter. What matters is you're part of something that you believe in and you enjoy. And that's right. what it's going to be like at first. You're going to always do shitty things, but do it for a place that you feel you want to be part of. That's very important. Thank, thank you, Martha. This um, a question comment is from uh, Catherine Dwyer, who is a, uh, uh, a landscape architect, and she's teaching uh, uh, in the School of Architecture here at RPI. She says, thank you for this remarkable discussion tonight, an urgent call to action, much needed for all of us. I'm a landscape architect with a BA in geology, so you are seriously yeah. speaking to my language about the deep section would love <laughs> would love to hear your thoughts on compressing time scales relative to geologic time and the current pace of huge events i'll restate that yeah <laughs> uh, <laughs> sorry i'm I don't, I don't <laughs> it's, a it's a little late and Catherine's brilliant yeah uh, I'm, she sounds brilliant i'm not uh, that brilliant Let's see. Uh, would love to hear your thoughts on compressing time scales relative to geological, well, geologic time and the current pace of huge events. Well, Climate events like, like fish kills. That's what she said. Climate events like fish kills. Oh. And temperature rise. Well, I probably have a really dumb answer because I don't, I, it's hard for me to really understand. I mean, I know about geological time uh, and I know that what's happening in the present, it doesn't even make a mark on it. Yeah. Um, so it would have to be some other relational kind of coming together so you could somehow um, pair them up. Hmm. I mean, you know what, that's a damn good question and I can't answer it, but it's, you know, I, I start seeing things spatially. How, how would that be spatialized? How would that be drawn? How could that, and, and what is it that it would tell you? Um, how, what would you learn from that? So I don't have enough information to be able to muster that up, but I think just in terms of that kind of visualization and getting back to what we were talking about, mm. and, and you said this, Evan, which is so true, the scientists suck at getting information out. They, and they, I, if you ever read um, Losing Earth, which is an incredible, you can get it, it's a PDF, 
Uh, mm -hmm. It's when uh, the scientists were uh, coalesced to actually uh, deal with uh, the presidency at the time, this Bush, I believe, and uh, really tell them exactly what's happening with the climate. And Exxon got on board at the same time. And there were all these incredible scientists. But because they were scientists, their ability to actually make it happen because of their communications yeah. fell apart. And you know, you said this, it was very interesting what, you know, that, that you got this, is that the description of why one degree is so difficult to understand, you never see that in any of the science books. But understanding how people understand, you know, ideas, th that's not their thing. We know how to do that because we make diagrams, we have to converse with other people, we have to convince other people that they, we know what we're doing and why we're doing it. We're able to communicate through visualizations and through, you know, giving presentations. So our ability to pull something like that together and to explain to people what the scientists cannot would create a huge value to getting things going. Right. You know, visualization, like that great, I mean, that Richard Weller did that goddamn mountain that's, I don't know, 30 miles up. I mean, that's a lot of carbon dioxide. I mean, who knew? No, it's, it, it's, a, it's, it's a communication problem and uh, certainly uh, both landscape and, and, and architects yeah. Architects are familiar with how powerful representational systems work, but you yes. also you also have a problem, which is that that a, a good portion of this of the human species is interested in instant gratification, and anything that that goes beyond their time, their attention span, forget time span, their attention span constitutes a, a real problem or challenge. And so th there's a big leap here that has to be made. I mean, it, it will require yeah. some of the most uh, creative and savvy individuals in a variety of disciplines just to figure out the, the weaknesses of, 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 of our own way of thinking and a ways to overcome it, to understand that it's in our best interest both now and in the future, right? Well, why don't we do that? That's a great project. Why don't we do that? Yeah, I mean, yeah. really trying to figure out how we can better serve and communicate to younger people. I mean, you know, that, that, that is so critical. Uh, last last uh, uh, question, because I know it's, it's a long evening and, and you may be oh. a little tired. Um, you know, the way higher education is set up and often even in the arts, uh, unknowingly, we create curriculums and pursue research that that can often be detached from the world around us. That we we're we're, we're great at dreaming and and uh, sustaining the the chase to to make that dream more interesting and and more interesting. Um, given, I mean, when I. I can only speak for myself, and maybe you you felt the same way. And it was you you seem to articulate this when early in your career when you pursued land art and and wanted to do kind of non conventional take non conventional route in landscape. Um, the urgency of the of the planet and the things that we mentioned before are so profound that one would like to charge our students with uh, the ability to leverage their intellect and creativity politically. Yes. Right, we, you're talking about, you know, building coalitions and partnerships, mm -hmm. being entrepreneurial, but yeah. also recognizing that art is a political activity and, and, and that they have to go into a space that may be seemingly Oh, I don't know. Um, sinister, uh, filled with compromise, and and uh, you know, if you just turn on the TV and 
listen what's happening in the politics in this country for the for the last four years it's it's deeply depressing but nevertheless uh, that happens to be part of the if i can excuse the term the landscape the context within which we need to make changes so I, i'm curious what advice would you give students to be able to be more successful in lever leveraging and realizing their dreams during their lifetime uh, uh, with, with all the resistance, with all the difficulty involved? Um, and, and what can we offer them now as skill sets, as knowledge in that journey? Well, gosh, you know, I have a 19 year old daughter and she's just starting college. And I think that understanding that we have to kind of build our own life raft, that, that we have to construct it ourselves. And it's a lifetime pro process about what that life raft is. Um, that change is constant. That's just a law of the universe. And um, challenges and issues and problems and obstacles are also just part of the universe. I think that we are at the beginning of an incredible transition. So in one sense, there are all sorts of things that can be done, that should be done, that hasn't been done before, and things that shouldn't be done that hasn't been not done before. I mean, uh, we're, we're, we are like in the, the beginning of a whole new in, industrial era. Right. We're in a whole new way of kind of understanding our relationship to the earth. We are in a whole new era of um, the continuation of the development of technologies. Um, it's almost like there's just too much out there to even think about in terms of this is not business as usual anymore. You know, that, that damn graph. I mean, so I really do think that uh, following your nose, uh, remember, you're not in a business as usual situation anymore. There are a lot of things that may pop up. Um, I do think that, I mean, one thing that just pops up into my head is that, um, you know, cr go, finding people who, who have the same kind of values as you do and uh, find their friendship and it doesn't, they don't have to be landscape architects. It can be all sorts of different kinds of people, but I think it's a very important time to make those connections with other people because um, it's gonna be very important because we don't have these structures that are kind of setting around us anymore. I mean, all thing, everything is going very wonky and weird. Right. Right. And it makes it more important to have, you know, a small group of people or things you can join up with and be part of, I think are very, very important because you, you, you kind of have to make your own um, structures now. My, my daughter has gotten right to it. She was, she went, she's at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor and she's really kind of bored because there isn't enough work for her to do online, but she's starting, she wants to get into, a, you know, she, you know she's, she's a, an advocate for Amnesty International and she, you know, she's busy, uh pulling together, you know, going to other groups and rushing for this one fraternity that is both female, male, but based around law and kind of making these things up. So I think you have to work at really venturing out, getting outside your shell, you know, making friends with people and, uh, and, and learning. There's, look, there's so much to learn outside of what you're learning now. Right. Things that you're really interested in. I mean, I just kind of quit my damn office, quit teaching, just to read up on what I was really focused on at that time. And from there, uh, a whole world has kind of expanded for me. 
Hey, hey Martha, those are fantastic closing comments um, on behalf of the entire school. I want to thank you. It was a, a, a profound lecture. It really was. It was oh, thanks, Evan. Thank astonishingly you. insightful. And I said it was a master class. It was. And it, it, uh, it was also generous and poignant and timely. So I thank you. And I would love to have you come back in person once we're all vaccinated. Okay. <laughs> and maybe there's an opportunity to, to uh, uh, conduct a workshop. And, and, I, and I, want, I want all the students to see your work and, and they can go online, but we can have a follow-up session as well. I would love to, Evan. Thank you so much. You've really been quite a wonderful host. And I'm, I'm happy that you're happy with the lecture. I mean, there was so much more to say. I was having a hard time. Like, I got to cut this out. This is, I can't do this. But um, I think the most important thing in terms of translating what's going on is to show the lives of people and how this is affecting them. Right. Because that people get. And it makes you actually feel for other people. Because all the graphs of the world won't get you there like that. So true. You know, it's very, very important that we, and, it's, and that's the same in design also, right? So how we feel, all that nonlinear thinking, very, very important. Well, you've so got-, you've got I'll pick you up, I'll definitely, I'll come. Martha, you. you have to live forever because you have a lot of work to be done. And well, I, 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 I can't live past 96 because I have a, I, I, I have a uh, life insurance for like $2 million. So I need to croak before then, definitely. Uh, I have a timeline. <laughs> well, listen, kudos, uh, big hugs and congratulations. Wonderful lecture. Love you. Thank you, Evan. Thank you so much. Thank you all for staying here for all this time. I really enjoyed it. Okay, Martha. Thank you. Bye -bye. I'll send you the reading list. Bye. Yes, please do that. Thank I you. will. Bye.